Hello, you are watching part two of the curved cabinet build. We made this bit in part one, so if you've not seen that, then it's probably best to watch that part first. But this episode, we're going to be making the doors and finishing the whole cabinet off. So it should be quite an interesting watch. Much the same as part one. I'm going to take some poplar or tulip wood and I'm going to rip it down into some thin strips and laminate them around the former that we made in the first video and that's going to give me the rails and the styles for the door so i'm not going to spend too much time going over that process so there's a couple of clips of getting the timber out and then we'll cut straight to putting the veneers in the bag Right, let's glue these together. This time I've got thinner laminations than what I used on the frame. I used three mil thick pieces for the frame section. These are just over two mil. There's 12 of them. It's gonna get me a finish of, a, of just over 25 mil. So it's sort of just, just over two mil thick each. Uh, using the glue applicator again, I read the instructions and noted that the little lip on the front actually hangs it on the stand there. I was using the stand that way around thinking this little bevel was a, a sort of a well for the excess glue to sit into. It would work that way around but it's meant to sit like that so that you've got a nice stand and it keeps this off the floor and it doesn't get any debris on the roller. pop up on the screen how long that actually took. So apparently the glue sets quicker with heat, so you can buy proper heat mats. But since I'm a farmer at heart, an old electric blanket, I'll just have to go cold at lunch. Should do the trick. Another good thing about the glue roller is, if there's any lumps in the glue, it tends to eat them out because there's such a fine tolerance between the alley roller and the glue pot that it tends to sort of work any lumps out as it goes.
So while the door styles are gluing up, I had to add uh, extra packing. I forgot I needed two packs, so there's four door styles. Bit of a rookie error there. I've got them going off in the bag. They're about four hours to glue up, so I'm just gonna work on the cross rails and get them tenoned while I wait for that to go off. Like we did on the frame, I'm just gonna refer to the drawing and then start marking out where my shoulder positions are from here. So I've drawn the doors on here, so they're the shoulder positions. Hopefully you can see that. I've got a big enough rail to do the whole thing in one go, so I can pick and choose which section of the rail I want. These are pretty good. If I line the inside up, how it came off the saw. I guess it's that way around. Yeah, it's that way around. If I line that up, there like that. Obviously perfect, because it was cut that way. There's a slight discrepancy if I swap the two pieces over on top of each other. Very, very slight. The inside is absolutely perfect. There's about half a mil. You know, I think that's just going to depend how it, the laminations form. So any lumps in the glue, lumps in the, in the lamination, or anything like that. You're going to get the slight discrepancy on that outside. So a little bit proud there. It's had under there, slightly proud there, but it's a very, very minimal discrepancy in that outside curve. I guess if you wanted an absolutely perfect outside curve, you'd have to make the former so that the outside was the bit that it seated against, and then the inside was sort of relative to whatever was going on within the laminations. But even if I flip that over and upside down, it's not a million miles out of alignment. You know, we've got lots of small bits, but by the time it's sat in that frame, you're not going to see it against that bevel. So, pretty happy with how it turned out. What I do tend to find I've got is from sort of about two and a half to three inches from the end of the, the lamination, it just starts to sort of, it's not, it's not fully compressed that down to the form, so it just starts to straighten out at that point. So if you're planning on using right up to the NZ pieces, you might well, you will be better off having a bigger mould and longer pieces and then starting your cut from a bit further in. So I'm going to take that into consideration and form my pieces based on the centre portion of my mould here. So as it sits there, I can't see where my positions are. So I'm just going to extend these lines out so I can see them when the mould sat over the top. So if you remember from the first video with the frame, we mark the uh, inside of the shoulder. So I'm going to do the same thing here. So we've got two pieces. If I mark that shoulder position here. Pretty accurate, it's really, really nice. Can mark shoulder position, shoulder position. So I can square them over. So they're the points at which I want to put my rails into the tenoner and line up with the shoulder that I've got marked on that machine. So I'm just going to cut these off, I'm going to add, add about 35mm on and then uh, cut them off on the cross cut. What I might do actually is mark that 35 on the template and then they can all be cut the same. I'm just going to check that my other door is indeed the same measurements as the first one. Yeah, spot on. What am I guess was it? Right, so let's make a little sled to hold them in again. Much as I did last time, I'm looking to cut a sled that fits the outside of this curve. So it's going to be using the bandsaw turntable again, like I did in the 
frame with the egg, working from the pivot to the outside of the bandsaw cuts so the, the material left is the same radius as to that point there on the outside of these rails. We can take that measurement off from the drawing. It is a blue 601 mil from 100 mil, so that's 500 of one mil on this side of the blade to my pivot hole. There. So I'll drill another hole just slightly off from this one. It's almost like the thickness of the bandsaw blade because you're working from the other side of it. So the way I get around that is just to drill it slightly offline from that uh, centre line I've drawn. This is one of my sharper drill wits that I sacrifice. Doesn't matter that it's slightly offline, you're still passing a circular point about the front of the blade, and the little bandsaw blades there have got quite a good pitch on the teeth or a good set, so it will still catch a, a true curve. So, put my bit through the template again into the right hole, and get in the wrong hole. Then we just need some external curve pieces. The bit of the curve that I need is going to be on the outside of the blade here. So oh, it's giving me a nice true curve around the outside of my rails. I can check that with the outside of my rails. So what I need to do now is cut along like I did before so that the flat of the cut intersects the surface. Or the, the true point of the curve. So if I mark where it intersects, it's just here. Then I'm going to mark 100 mil back from that intersection point. So my 100 mil marks. 100. I need to cut along this line. So I can actually cut, get rid of these feather edges if I wish to. All that I'm interested in is that point of intersection plus the 100 mil. So if I square them over, like so that should give me two perfectly matched pieces of wood. Sorry, I'll just get rid of them fluffy ends. There you go. So when you line the two 100 mil marks up, you should have two nicely flat and square. They should be square to each other about the curve. And I can make my tenon jig from that. So I just need to space these apart. So it's a 70 mil jig. So I'm gonna want what, 70 less 36 or 30? 30, 37. Do -do, do -do. What about a 32, 32 mil piece that's going to sit between them?
Right, so I've already got my 100mm mark from the shoulder line here. So I just need to attach this 100mm mark in the appropriate position. Treat. Operator's point of view. So, pushing the rail in, sliding it around the around the form till it hits the stop, making sure it's nice and flush on the jig and up against the, the back fence here and I'm looking for this shoulder line to be in line with the cut shoulder line on the ten and a piece. I'm not going to mind too much break out here because these rails are actually about 8mm wider than they need to be so I can cut 4mm off this side and 4mm off this face after I've tenoned them so you can get a nice sharp corner to them so I'm not too bothered about that bandsaw cut being a little bit gappy against the back of the piece. Get the piece in position, clamp the handle down and then you can run it through. should hold it nice and tight and keep a parallel tenon through the two heads. There we go, that's the finished product. Nicely tenon, got well, 76 mil. So I'm just gonna clean what I've labeled as the inside edges up until they're nice and clean. I'm gonna leave the outside. So if they were 72, 74 mil still, that's gonna give me a bit of wiggle room when I come to fit in. So I can always trim that off afterwards, but if I make them dead on 70 or slightly under now, then I'm going to be struggling for height on the door post glue up. So yeah, just get these inside edges nice and clean. Right, I've got to do something now that I've not done in a long time. I've got to change the spindle. I'm going to put the router spindle in the spindle molder to cut the grooves in the curved rails. Not even, I've not took this out in about seven years. I've never used the router spindle in anger. So this will be interesting. How's it work again? It's all a bit seized up, I think. So 
two bearings. I've replaced them about five or six years ago. Not sounding particularly healthy, but they're not loose yet, see. So. Uh, belts, that's the three speeds. So you can change between the three speeds. Then obviously the spindle sticks up above. Pairing that to my well used router spindle, covered in rust. And you've got one speed that runs on the quickest pulley of the spindle moulder and it's a really small turned shaft on this so that I get 15,000 RPM which is a little bit quicker than the other spindle can go. And then you've got a router collet on the top. So I'm just going to clean that up actually. So I've owned this spindle for about 12 or 13 years I've never actually used a router set up on it. So finally take this belt out, swap it for a slightly smaller one. Caught me out actually when I got the machine. I snapped the belt. Not long after I'd had it, one of the belts gave up and snapped. It was all perished. I thought, oh, it, it came with a spare belt, I'll put that on. That's when I realised that uh, this belt is very, very slightly smaller than the other one because this is machined smaller. So, I didn't have a spare belt. There we go. Let's see if that'll go on there now. Oh, aye. Well, that's how you meant to do it. So that's worked quite well on that little test piece. The little guides there just help you as you feed it in, get a nice smooth curve, and then you've got something on the takeoff side so you're not sort of going to wobble around that centre point. But uh, yeah, it work, works nice and smoothly. Uh, I can't groove the rails until I've cut the panel and I know what position the panel is going to sit in. So I'm going to get the panel gluing up in the bag and then in the morning. I can start work on the rails and do all my styles and everything. Right, let's get these styles out of the press. Now I can glue the panels up and that should be everything laminated then. Put some extra boards on here to pack the panel away from the inside face of the doors. So this is the last thing I need to go up.
middle. So that's pretty much bang on. I'm just going to wind the chisel back. Just a touch. There we go. That'll do. So setting out for a shaker door like this is really simple. We've got the height 720. I'm going to come in about five mil from each end. Mark off of the hundred. So I'm marking 820 at the other end. Then I'm going to mark in the height of my rails, which is 70. Both ways. Then I'm going to have a, a groove depth of 8mm. So, because that's in line with the tenon, I need to put a setback on there. Because the tenon gets eaten away by the groove. Let's do these in pairs. A little bit of a wobble along there. It's not the straightest style. Right, that'll do for tonight, but obviously you can't leave without seeing how much progress you've made. So I've still got the little bevel scribes to do, or put the bevels on the rails. But should should just slightly push together. The joints will be slightly misaligned because they've got to go into the tenon more to be absolutely perfect. So another four or five mil. We've got what looks like the beginnings of a curved door. I have to say that's gone a lot better than I expected. And I've got two little curved doors. Call it a night and I'll see you in the morning. Okay, so next morning I'm going to take the panels out of the press. Right, put the vacuum bag away because I think I'm finished with it now. I've curved all the components. I've got the two panels and the two doors. So I've just got a couple of bits to do. I need to groove the curved rails for the panel and then put a groove up the styles, which is fairly easy on the adjustable groover. So I can set that up now. I've got the thickness of these panels. And then I need to put the bevels on the styles and rails, much the same as I did the frame, so that the joint, the, sh the bottom shoulder there, goes up and meets the style. Once I've done that, I can have a bit of a test fit of the door and then do a bit of sanding work on the insides of the frames and sand these panels up. I might even get a coat of paint on them before I glue them together. Groove that the width of that panel varies from 9.7 to 9.9 mil. So I want the edge of the groove 10 mil from the outside. So let's just see where we can get that. We use one of the wider rails, so one that is so that one's 75. And do a little test cut that's just a, a millimeter or so tall. Then if it's in the wrong place, I can trim that off and then I've got
got another bite of the cherry. So hopefully that didn't look too dangerous. Um, it is only a little router cut up, but they can still do quite a lot of damage. And it's quite small pieces we're working with, but that's got the initial groove cut. And if I just look at that from a side profile, you'll just see that the router bit isn't quite the right size. So I'm just gonna make another pass with the fence pushed back about two mil and that should open that groove up. Right, now they're a nice little fit. I'll just run me rusty glue scraper down these edges. Get rid of any tails. I mean, I feel slightly unprofessional that the tenon isn't absolutely perfectly in line with the groove. I'm almost considering starting the job again. Oh well, there's always room for a bit of improvement. Now from that point there, I can measure from the face to the groove. I can put the same groove in the uprights using a normal spindle cutter. So we've got 9.98, so pretty much 10 mil. 10.01, 10 exactly. So 10 mil from the groove to the face, so I'll just set up a cutter to do that. Right now I'm happy with the groove. I've set it up so that the widest part of the panel is sort of a nice tight fit in that groove. So that's the widest bit just there. It just, just slots in. What I don't want to do is make it too tight, but by the time this has been sanded, that should slip in quite easily. But we have got now a joint that goes together. Looking too bad, not looking too bad. So it's just a case of adding the 45 degree bevel to the styles and the rails.
Right, so I think that groove is pretty much right. Or groove, I mean uh, bevel. So what I've just got to do is nip out for the last section of the tenon where you see it on the top and the bottom of the door. I left the mortiser slightly short. So that gap there I've got to remove from the bottom of the tenon down here. Kind of difficult with the camera right in there. What I've ended up with is a slightly off centre spring angle. I've got to cut the top of this rail off where this breakout is. So that's not the end of the world. Just a little bit more out that chink. The back shoulder's just got a very, very slight gap when the front bevel seats up. And I could see that as I was machining it. So I've machined this bevel slightly more than I wanted. I'm just gonna run a, a sharp plane down this inside edge to take this shoulder down. Anyway. That seat's a lot better now. I'll push that up there. The seat's quite nicely. That is a bloody nice fitting joint. I'm gonna push the doors together, sit them on my template. And then I know my groove width and I can mark from the template the width of the panel. Stunner of a joint. Alright, so sit the door on the template, mark my shoulder positions which are perfect to the template. So I can sit the panel on there and take my measurement from that position. Right then, moment of truth. A very tactile thing. Curved door. There we go. Looks alright, that. Seems to be fairly flat as well as it hits the deck. There we go. Quite impressed. Alright, let's have a sit on the drawing. I'm going to say that's not a bad attempt. I'll just push that back a couple of mil in both directions. You can see 
the uh, line round here and the line just here. Pretty much spot on. Right. There you go, sports fans. Couple of doors. Obviously, you a lot of fitting yet, but. So I'm just going to disassemble the doors and get a coat of paint on the inside edges and on the panels, so all of the flat surfaces of the panel. And that's going to allow, if there's any panel movement, if, that, if it shrinks, then you've still got a visible line of painted surface. Whereas if you paint the panel after it's been glued up, then the panel then shrinks, you get like a, a, a visible line of unpainted timber, which doesn't look as good. So. It's always good to have them pre-painted. It also helps with the denibbing process. It's a lot easier to denib right into the corners of the panel if you do it before glue up than if you try and denib once it's been glued up. There's also an added advantage of painting it before glue up in that any glue squeeze you get is really easy to clean off from the painted surfaces. So you have to be careful that you don't paint where you want to glue, so I tend to mask them areas but it means when you do glue up and it, it does squeeze out with the PU glue that I'm going to use that it's dead easy to clean up. So when I glue these up they're going to be done on the mould. So what I need to be careful of is that the glue squeeze is dead easy to clean off because I'm not going to be able to get to it. So on the camera, it's probably really hard to see what I'm trying to achieve here with the sanding or the denibbing. But if you cast the workpiece across a piece of light, you're probably not going to see it, but you're looking for the change in the colour. So there's a slight glossiness to the paint and where you've sanded it, it goes a matte colour. And what we're trying to achieve is a completely matte finish. So you're sanding the paint until every bit of glossiness, so every bit of reflection off the paint turns to a matte colour. And you want that to happen before you break through to the unpainted wood. So what you're looking for on a perfectly primed surface is that fully sanded, smooth and no breakthrough to the layers below. So um, that's good enough for what I need before I glue it up, but it's going to need a another coat but you can see how easy it is so this this bit here in particular is very very difficult to sand when there's a panel here and another door piece here it's really difficult to get in and sand that corner whereas while the, the piece is disassembled I can get a perfect finish on that really really easily So that's gluing up nicely, it's touching 
everywhere on the mould and there's no pressure. So if I lift one end, it lifts off nice and evenly, sits down parallel back on the mould. So I don't think there's a twist in it. I'm just going to double check it by holding it onto the frame. Perfect. That is perfect. Beautiful. Put that down nice and flat. I've set these pretty tight, so I've only got about three mil down the middle there with it sat on the form there, so there's no gap at the sides. But what I'm going to do is uh, put the frame into the carcass, so screw it to the carcass, and then that gives me the definite true curve of the frame, and then I can hang the door off the frame and then work to the centre marks with each door, and just fit the doors in off the hinges and, and tweak them back into the frame. So obviously it's the further they get let into the frame, the smaller the radius, the smaller the door can be. So if, you know, I don't want to go too far because then if it sits too far and you can't bring it out because you can then get too big a gap. So I'm, it's taken me this long to get here. I'm just going to hang them knowing they're going to be a bit tight and then work my way in up to that point. So I'm going to set up the router jig before chopping the hinges in. These frames require two jigs to do the hinges because the doors sit back the 5mm of the bevel of the frame. So I've made one jig that routes the deeper cut for the frame and I've got a separate one that does the cut for the door that is about 45 to 5 mil less in depth so that the door sits in the right position on the frame. So all I need to do is off the back of the jig there, wind the cutter down until it's exactly on that thing. I'll just put a little note there, half a mil less is the perfect setting. So I'll just make sure I'm just, just off that cut, lock the router off, and then I know I'm gonna be pretty damn close with my router setting for cutting these hinges in. It's dead quick, that's now set up. There's no messing about whatsoever. I drilled these holes where I knew the uh, hinges were gonna go, so the frame fixing is exactly where the hinge is going to go. Check out the description if you want to see a little link to making this, this hinge jig, but, uh, well not this particular one. They're dead easy to make, it's just a, two bits of wood rebated over each other, let the back off so that the clamp can fix in place. Remember, we're cutting wood fibres, not 
ripping them out. The nice sharp chisels. Look at that bonny job. Perfect setting inch. Let's go have a little look after putting the doors on. We've got, I've just tweaked one hinge back a little bit, so this one. I've deepened the door slightly there to just, just tweak the doors in ever so slightly to get rid of a little bit of a, a twist in the door. It's about one mil twist in the door, so just a, a touch more and that should take that out. But uh, the gap along here, this hinge needs letting in a little bit more just to get that nice and even. And that'll bring the gap in the middle a bit better. Um, and that one looks pretty good. That's the right gap and the right, it's nice and even all the way up. So I can do that. I'll chuck this hinge in now and then see how it looks. If you ever deepened a hinge, by chiseling a bit away like this and then put the door back on and found that actually it's not moved and wondered how that's worked so then you take a little bit little bit more off and then the door moves loads you've got to be really careful where you take the material off the hinge if you took half a mil to nothing from half a mil deep cut there to nothing there you're going to throw the door across more than if you take a half a mil cut all the way across the full width of the housing. And that's because the pivot point of the hinge is thrown away from the housing uh, exit point there. So the pivot point's over here. So if you suddenly angle your housing and push the pivot point further this way, the more angled it is, the further out the knuckle is, the more it's going to move the door over. So you've got to be really careful when you're adjusting the hinge. If you want just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of movement on the, the hinge adjustment, you've got to be careful exactly of where you're taking that material away so it doesn't throw that door over or do something bad to it. You can then uh, get over that problem again. If you've taken too much off this front and it's thrown it too much, you can bring it back without making without putting a packer behind the hinge by chopping the back of the hinge out so that like the toe of the hinge then sits deeper and will throw the, the knuckle back towards the door and open your gap up a little bit. It's surprising really how much adjustment you've got on a hinge without actually having to use a packer or having any gaps showing. So it's uh, they're pretty versatile at how much you can adjust or move a hinge before you need to do anything too drastic. Ah, uh, that's better. So I took a nice thin shaving off there. Now we've got a nice even gap all the way down that door. Now I'm going to sit the doors together in the middle. If I close one to the position where it's going to sit, the other one doesn't quite close so it's touching and the gap is pretty good. So the fit's perfect. 
I just need about two mil, so one mil off of each of these doors off this centre. So there's a slight slide rise right here. And a slight drop at the bottom. So when I'm fitting it, I'm just going to have a little, little tweak because I'll have the doors in place. And uh, you see how racking that frame alters the fit of the doors. So it also slightly helps that line them down the, the height of the door. So I'm just going to put a slight rack on it. It's nothing, that is, that is half a mil of racking, which is absolutely so I'm bloody pleased with that. It's fallen slightly off the centre mark. I took a bit of a big bite out of one door from the planer and was worried I'd cut too much at the end there, but uh, the, the gap's right and uh, it's not very far off centre, so looking good. Right, sanding these insides, I was going to just use a soft pad and let it sort of contour, but I think it's got a few little steps in places. I'm going to end up with a right wavy, it's just not going to be very professional. So I'm just going to cut on the bandsaw out of a thick piece of wood, a sled to this sort of right inner curve. And I can use some uh, high, like low grit, like 60 or 80 grit paper and just, just sand the rails in by hand. So after going over with the sander there, I've just put the doors back on just to check that I've not sanded you know, taken too much of an edge off because you're a bit reliant on, on feel sanding it by hand like that but they're looking pretty good still a nice sharp line around that inside bevel I need to set a magnet in the door bottoms and tops and a counterpart magnet in the frame so I can mark them up while the doors are on. You can see how this magnet process is done more in depth if you follow the link in the description to the magnet video. I'll uh, put a link in the description to this, but you guys are going to want to get on this tool. Look, hang the tape off the edge of the material, and you can set set out right up to the end. Doesn't fall over. Obviously, if you extend the tape out a little bit it will hold itself with the weight of the tape and there's no hook on the end either so it's perfect for setting out onto panel materials or measuring up to, to panels and marking off so it's like having a wooden folding rule in your pocket that is three meters long and seamless when you press the button with it coiled up there's no spring at all in it it's just a roll of uh, coil of tape when you fold that out, it changes the orientation of the spring or the cup in the roll of tape and that gives it enough pressure because it wants to unfold now that when you release the brake it'll actually wind itself out. It's quite, quite a cool little bit kit actually. I saw a guy doing the worktops using one to mark out his templates and he's holding it over the edge of the a piece of Corex and it wasn't falling off and it's really accurate so yeah had to get me one of them like I said link in the description if you fancy one I'm sure you will put it on your Christmas list
Right, I'm going to put some shelving in it now while it's assembled before I paint it. So I've cut some shelf strips to height of the cupboard. I'm just going to tape them in place. We've got a couple for the back here, so what I might do is I might cut one of them down so that they protrude out an even amount from each other in the back of the cupboard. I can glue that in place. Perfect. So then my two cut lines for a tight shelf. I've already got a couple of lines on here, just to confuse matters. And just trim along the lines on the cross cut and sit it in. So, unlike normal sorties shelving, when you put weight on the front of the shelf, it obviously pivots about the straight line between the two points at which it's balanced on. So the shelf tends to tip. So what I've done is uh, made the shelf thickness and the thickness of the bottom strip suit the spacing in the sawtooth strip so I can encapsulate it with a second uh, shelf support. And that way there's no tip on the shelf but it's still adjustable, so you can remove these two pieces, lift your shelf up to where you want it, drop it back down, and put your shelf strips back in. You've got a nice secure shelf again.
Right then, quick walk around before I tear it down and paint it and lacquer the internals. So I've just got some filler on the plinth. There's a little bit of filling to do on the doors in places with a bit of torn grain, but that has gone really well. Beautiful gap all the way around the doors. They sit lovely together. Absolutely lovely. Up there. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, I can't really complain how it's gone. I've had quite a few people come in the workshop over the last week. Everyone's commented on it and sort of catches your eye, doesn't it? A bit of something different. Really pleased with the, the shelf idea of having the double strip and fitting it between them. That's made it really nice and solid. You know, if you put, put any amount of weight on the front of that shelf, it's not going anywhere at all. The shelf strip looks really good as well. It's much better than having shelf pin holes drilled in the side of the cabinet. Look at that door, I mean, it's beautiful, isn't it? Absolutely beautiful. Soft magnet clothes. Not got the stops on yet. But they'll, uh, they'll sit with me.
Right then, final assembly. It's always a nice stage to get to. There's that. That one goes there. Nice, ain't it? It's fun, isn't it? It looks lovely. 